Okay, so good morning, everyone, and welcome to Basic Business Law, our workshop um, this morning, Tuesday, May 10th. Um, thank you for taking the time to be with us, and thank you to Jeff, who we will introduce in a little bit. Uh, before we get started, I just wanted to cover some basic housekeeping. This workshop, as you are aware, is being recorded. So your choice to have your video on or off, um, it will not come through in the recording, but that's your call. We'd like you to feel comfortable this morning. We do ask that you meet yourself when you're not speaking. This is out of respect for one another and our presenter. And we'd ask that your name shows um, whether or not your video is on, just so that we can um, know who you are if you ask questions and uh, note you down for attendance. Um, we are welcoming your questions today, and the best way to do that would be to put them in the chat, and we will um, refer to them possibly throughout the session, possibly at the very end, we'll see how the flow goes. And I wanted to let you know that at the end of the workshop, you will be receiving an email with contact information for our microbusiness program, as well as statewide resources and a uh, link to this recording. So I'm going to pass this over to Simeon Geigel, who is our micro business development counselor at CBOEO, and he's going to introduce his program and then he'll introduce Jeff. Great. Thank you, Rachel. Much appreciated. Welcome, everybody. I'm so glad that you can join us for today's uh, presentation. I just want to take a moment to explain uh, and introduce you to the micro business development program. Micro Business Development Program is a statewide program that works with low to moderate income Vermonters to help them start or expand a business. There's no fee for our services, uh, but um, uh, we do have to confirm that people do meet our income eligibility guidelines, which is based on the number of people in the household versus the household's total income for the last 30 days. So if you're interested in learning if you qualify, don't hesitate to contact me or John Gurgley or Pacific Sangayuva. Both of their um, names and contact information is listed below and will be included in the email that um, Rachel will, um, will provide everybody. My, thanks. So I mentioned uh, micro business is a statewide program. And so uh, there's a total of five micro businesses around the state and each micro business um, covers a certain set of counties or, or, or our territories. Um, you can see uh, the different agencies listed and uh, on your screen. And this will also be included in the information Rachel will send out and what counties they serve. So um, it makes it easier for you to connect with one of those agencies. Uh, our program uh, is the CVOEO program and we cover Chittenden, Addison, Franklin and Grand Isle counties. <clears throat> so let's get to why we're here today. So we are lucky and much, uh, have much appreciation for the fact that uh, Jeff Wick, uh, local business law attorney with uh, Wick and Maddox is joining us today. I know that there are a number of different legal topics out there um, and, ma and many of you have uh, uh, sent in your questions for Jeff and I've certainly got some of my own too. And so uh, I think that this will be more like a um, a conversation today where Jeff is presenting and uh, I'll step in with questions to, and if anything I feel needs clarity. Um, so I do want to just mention that uh, you know if you have questions we ask that you post them in the chat and if you're not familiar with um, with Zoom if you kind of shake your mouse you'll see at the bottom of the screen there's a little icon and the word chat so if you click on that button you'll be able to type it type it in there and it will go out to everybody unless you select somebody specific to send it to. But we just ask that you, um, you know, click on everybody so we can all see the question. So thank you so much. Glad you could join us. And Jeff, I'll turn it over to you. Uh, thanks, Simeon. Thanks, Rachel. I appreciate it. Uh, and thank you. It looks like we have six people in attendance and about right. Is it Pacific, uh, Dan, John, Chrysanthemum, Charlie and Andy? Welcome. <clears throat> um, I'll tell you a little bit about my background briefly. That's sometimes helpful to get some context. And then, um, you know, I would love it. No, no, uh, you're, you're not compelled to do this. But if anyone would like to tell me a little bit uh, briefly about yourselves or what brought you to this particular seminar, uh, love to hear it. Because, uh, you know, you just never know when you meet other people. 
including uh, you meeting others on this presentation, where that might lead in the future. So it's good to make connections. Um, <clears throat> and um, in order to say something about yourself, um, I have no problem if you've uh, Dan, I appreciate you've got your video on, uh, but nobody should feel compelled to do that. So I respect it either way. Um, but if you do want to say something about yourself, just turn on your video uh, after I do my little spiel. And then that'll indicate that you'd like to say something, you know, I'll, I'll call on you. I'm, I'm sort of old school. I'm not really a Zoom expert, but uh, I'll try my best. Okay, so um, a little tiny bit of background about me. I've been, I'm in my 20th year practicing law here in Vermont. Um, <clears throat> my main areas of practice have been um, business law. So I do a fair amount. Uh, I have over the years still do of business formations. So I form LLCs, corporations uh, for clients. I help them when they're buying a business, starting a business, or if their business needs bank financing. I help with the legal work that supports that. I also do a lot of real estate transactions. A lot of people who start businesses end up uh, also ultimately needing some real estate legal assistance, whether that's with a lease, a commercial lease, or whether that's buying the building in which you're operating or the con a commercial condo unit in which you're operating. And so let's see, that is business, real estate. And the other area that I practice in is wills, trusts, estate planning, and uh, related topic, which is probate administration. How, does, how do your affairs get settled when you, when you die? And that's called the probate process. So I find that uh, that's a helpful little subset of areas of law. I don't, I'm not a trial lawyer. Don't purport to be not a not a tax lawyer, not a criminal lawyer. There's so many areas of law; it's it's unbelievable. And uh, as a legal practitioner, you find that you have to focus because there just aren't enough hours in the day, and each area of law is big enough that you have to find your focus to get good at one, two, maybe three areas of law. So anyway, that's what I've been doing for 20 years. And uh, Wick and Maddox, the law firm has two offices, one in Burlington on College Street, about halfway up the hill to UVM, and the other in Essex Junction on Grove Street, which is about a third of a mile, that third of a mile east of the five corners. And specifically, I've actually been operating our Essex office for two years now. Before that, I was uh, at our Burlington office for the 17 plus years there. That's a little bit about me. Um, let's see, oh, maybe a tiny bit more. Uh, I got my law degree at Boston University Law School, and I also have uh, an MBA degree, Master's of Business Administration, which I also got from uh, Boston University School of Management. And before that, I went to UVM, and I was an English major and a history minor, and grew up here in Burlington. So that's probably all you would, more than you'd ever want to know about your presenter today. So does anybody want to say anything about them? What brought them here? That might help guide my presentation. Who knows? If you don't, don't worry. We'll just get right into it. Dan, go for it. Yeah, uh, thanks. My name is Dan. Uh, I have a, I'm a recording engineer, and I have a small recording studio that I share with two partners, potentially a couple more joining in as like a collective. Uh, we rent a space. Uh, we're on a very tenuous lease-free agreement with this old school landlord um, and he's selling the building. So we're kind of in this like uncertain middle ground about like how that's going to shake out with like the people that are buying the building and what we can do to like get a lease. But he's uh, not the most intelligent landlord um, and the lease that he has presented us with was like th three quarters of a page, all caps, typos, like it was just like not a real lease. So Anyway, but we, we have all these like different recording projects that we're doing. So I need to also like investigate contracts um, and start getting serious about like music entertainment law contracts um, and potentially like buying a building. And I also am launching a video series that's gonna be like a separate enterprise and that's gonna have its own set of like recording rights and um, like YouTube money distribution, all that sort of stuff. So 
uh, and I freelanced in audio and worked for a few different companies, helping them with audio and marketing, stuff like that. Oh, you're still muted, John. Generally Thank you correct. for letting me know. I'll start talking muted. That's awesome, Dan. Fascinating. And uh, good luck with that. Hope it goes very well for you. Uh, Andy, did you want to give your background? I'm Andy Thompson. I um, have been operating a small pet sitting business for a few years. Um, I'm a previous social worker, so this is a second career for me. And now my business is getting so big that I feel like it's time to, you know, make it an LLC or a sole proprietorship or something. So I really need to learn um, the differences with that and where I should go with this business. because I am the only one operating it. Um, but I wanted to know what kind of insurances I need. Um, so I did get injured last year at um, a client's house. Um, so I just want to be protected in every way that I can and get my business to a place where, um, you know, it's what I need to do to get it on the books and things like that. That's all. Sounds great. Good for you. Hope that continues to go well. Anybody else want to say anything about them? Hey, John. Yeah, hi. Um, I'm John Gurgley. I'm one of the business coaches here at CBOEO. Um, I'm, I'm reading a number of business plans from clients, so kind of listening to this with one ear, I'll confess. But I am interested in understanding, you know, one, one of the things that always comes up, much like Andy just said, it, it's that question, you know, that I, I want to be, I want to be legal. And, and the, the fact is that in my understanding in Vermont, you can be in business just by saying you're in business, essentially, you don't even need to register your business name. So this question comes up a lot in discussion with my clients is they'll say, oh, I, I need a lawyer or do I need a lawyer? And my answer to many folks who have minimal resources is no, you don't. You don't need a lawyer to start your LLC. And um, it's only when things get more complicated, when you're in, you want to incorporate, you want to really change your corporate structure, then probably that that's the appropriate time for legal help. So I'd like, I'd like to make sure that you cover that topic even to, to my, for my benefit is to, make sure we understand clearly when legal advice is and is not needed. Excellent. Just taking that down in note form. Okay, great. Sounds good, John. Thank you. Anybody else? All right. Well, if you change your mind at any time, you're, you're welcome to just turn the video on and raise your hand and we'll, we'll get you in there. Um, okay, well, we'll get started. Uh, I, um, I've got basically five general topics that I want to hit today, actually four, plus a Q&A session. And I think perhaps the most valuable part may be the Q&A session to make sure that I don't omit to cover anything that you want to hear. But in terms of what I've got on my agenda, generally speaking, number one, sole proprietorship versus limited liability company. That sort of gets to what John was suggesting he'd like to hear about a little bit, but I'll amplify on that. Number two, uh, we called it tips from separating yourself from your business, how and why. Number three, some possible considerations regarding commercial leases and uh, business contracts. And number four, um, somebody I think raised this question, so I put it on the list. Uh, federal and state business and tax ID numbers. Not a, not a huge topic there. The answer is yes, you need them um, in most cases. But, um, and then Q&A. And that's probably where we'll have the most fun maybe. We'll see. Okay, so we'll start with uh, topic number one, sole proprietorship versus LLC or the general concepts of sole proprietor 
and LLC, and maybe we'll throw in corporations too, because corporations are different from limited liability companies. Um, each of those two forms of entity, limited liability company and a corporation, are different. Why? Why are they different? They're different because they are different, what we call statutory entities. In other words, the only reason an LLC has a right to exist or that you have a right to form one is because the legislature of Vermont passed a law, which I'll call the LLC statute. And so these entities, these fictional paper entities that are different from yourself, but owned and operated by yourself are a sort of paper people. Um, and they provide some benefits, otherwise people wouldn't use them. And we'll talk about what those benefits are. Uh, likewise, a corporation is a much older form of paper person. And it exists only because the state of Vermont legislature has enacted a, a corporation statute. And corporations date back, well, I don't, I'm not an expert on this, but I know they at least date back to the 18th century, probably the 17th century when they became pretty popular in their predecessor forms as a way of, um, as a way of uh, um, enhancing and protecting the way to do business, a way to pool money, pool capital from different sources and different people and a way of uh, then separating the ownership from the management, right? You could have investors who provide the money and you could have managers who actually operate the business. And without some kind of a corporation, uh, there wouldn't be the concept of, um, of, well, limited liability for those who are capital providers. In other words, why would you put all your money at risk or really you wouldn't be as inclined to put so much money at risk if you knew that if the business did something wrong, even though you didn't cause it, could have been just an accident, that you could personally get sued and lose your entire life savings. And so that's really the answer as to why the corporation was formed. And same with the LLC, in a sense, similar with the LLC. Um, the LLCs really only started um, existing in the 1990s. So they're much more recent creatures of statute. And it turns out that for the most part, <clears throat> for all intents and purposes, for all small business law, I mean, small businesses, micro businesses, whatever you want to call them, there's really no more need to form an, a, a corporation when we've got the LLC statute. LLCs are simpler and cheaper to form and operate than corporations. I probably won't get into all the underlying details on that, um, but most people do LLCs now for, for good reason, for that very reason. And there's always a tax element to every aspect of business. Um, you know, I don't purport to be a tax lawyer. That's a specialty. I do know a lot of things about taxation of individuals and businesses and can answer general questions. But one thing I always tell my clients, my business clients, um, they'll often ask me tax questions because they think you're a lawyer, you're a business lawyer. You must know the answer to this business tax question. But really I say, well, just as you've decided that you need a lawyer to help you with the legal aspects, I strongly recommend you develop a relationship with a tax accountant, with a business tax accountant to help you with that piece. And then likewise, if you are successful enough that you need employees, I strongly recommend that you affiliate yourself with a payroll company because you'd be spending way too much of your precious time trying to figure out how to do payroll and associated compliance. That's a waste of time. That's what payroll companies are for. And then likewise, as a sort of general business, small business lawyer, I get a lot of questions about insurance and liability. And I say, well, you know, you wouldn't necessarily know coming to me and you should ask me all these questions, but I can help point into the right person, but just as you've got a lawyer and just as you've got a tax accountant and just as you've got a payroll company, 
please develop a relationship with a local commercial insurance agent. Because each of those areas is so specialized that one person can't know it all. Nobody can know it all. And so each of those four different kinds of people, as you grow your business, will be super helpful. And sometimes they'll have to interact. You know, oftentimes I'll have a call with, with the client and his or her accountant, or I'll have a call with the client and, and the client's um, uh, commercial insurance agent. Oftentimes there's some clauses in a lease that are insurance and indemnity related. And I say, look, I, I know what this stuff means, but I gotta be honest with you. You're taking on a lot of liability here. You're promising to indemnify the other side. I strong, and the lease requires you to obtain uh, specific criteria with respect to insurance. Say, this is where you should provide a copy of the lease to your insurance agent and say, hey, look at sections 10 and 11. Those have to do with insurance and indemnification. Can I, or can my business buy insurance that essentially offloads the risk onto an insurance company? You know, and, and also, can I buy the specific kind of insurance that I'm required to buy under this lease? And that's not something I'd know. That depends on the insurance marketplace, et cetera, et cetera. So that's another, you know, that's sort of part of the reason that's an ex explanation of why it's good to also have your insurance agent as a friend, so let's see. So we've talked briefly, getting back higher level, back up to corporations, LLCs. What is uh, an LLC? LLCs kind of come out of the concept, the historical concept of partnership. Um, and they also come out of the historical concept of individual or sole proprietor uh, because they're kind of a hybrid between partnership and or sole proprietor, depending on how many owners an LLC has. And just to put on the table some terminology that you'll want to know, and if you can remember this, this would be great uh, because it's helpful, because it's not intuitive. Every little sort of legal thing and many things in life, science, music, whatever, have their own jargon. So try to learn the jargon. The jargon's pretty simple. I'll give you the corporate jargon first. The jargon for a corporation, which you probably already know because it's so widespread, is the people who own the company, the people who provided the money, the capital, are called investors or owners or shareholders. Shareholders, a corporate shareholder. And so in a corporation, when you provide money uh, as an owner, you're getting typically a stock certificate evidencing your owner ship uh, in shares of the company. And so that's the ownership piece. And then the management piece, corporations are overall managed by their board of directors. So a corporation shareholders elect the board of directors. And the board is sort of the overseeing entity. It's not necessarily, although in a small business, it's the same people wearing three different hats. I got my shareholder hat, I take that off. I got my board of director hat, I got take that off. I got my, my uh, corporate officer hat and I even got a fourth hat called employee. I am the, the guy who washes the bottles, right? But in a larger corporation and as you grow, you might find that those roles are played by different people. Shareholders, board of directors, sort of the overall management. The board then hires the corporate officers, which are called like president, vice president, treasurer, corporation secretary. And, and don't be fooled by that word secretary. It doesn't mean secretary in the secretarial sense. It means the keeper of the official books of the corporation, the corporate secretary, the official keeper of the books and records, except the treasurer is the official keeper of the financial records. So those are traditional corporate titles of corporate officers. Uh, and then it's typically the officers who hire the rank and file employees. Now you got all four levels. You got the shareholders at the top. It's kind of like a pyramid. Shareholders, board of directors, officers, employees. That's corporate speak. Now move over to limited liability company speak. Um, members and managers. A limited liability company's owners are called its members. 
And if an LLC only has one owner, you're called a sole member or a single member LLC. Single member LLC, member. Manager, there's no, no such thing as a board of directors in an LLC. There are only two. Remember in the corporate form, you had four essentially. Well, well, forget the employees for a second. You had three at the corporate level shareholders, the directors, the officers. In an LLC, forget the employees for a second, you've got two. Members are the owners, managers are the operators. Managers are akin to the officers and the board combined. So, um, and there are fundamentally two kinds of LLC, a member-managed LLC and a manager-managed LLC. And you have to check that box when you file for that LLC with a Vermont Secretary of State. That's a fundamental distinction of what kind of an LLC you are. Um, and if you're a manager managed LLC, that means by definition, the owners are the operators. Think of it as an owner operated business. But if you're a, I hope I said member managed LLC, the owners are the operators. The manager managed LLC is where the managers manage the LLC but the members, the owners can be different people, can have different identities. So it could be that persons A, B, and C are the members, they're the owners, and they then decide who will operate the LLC as managers. And they could, um, they could hire um, managers D and E to actually operate. And you can mix managers and members in a manager managed LLC. Another way to think of this, if any of you are familiar with partnerships, is an L a manager managed LLC is a lot like a limited partnership. A limited, and I'm sorry to throw a whole bunch of, this is like uh, college business law 101, which I used to teach at Champlain College for about 10 years. But um, um, partnerships, limited partnership is that same kind of thing where the owners, the limited partners are different from the operators called the general partners. And what that gave the owners, the limited partners, is limited liability. What you cannot do, what you can do as a limited partner is provide the capital. What you cannot do as a limited partner is manage. If you manage, if you become the general partner too, you have jeopardized the whole reason for having a limited partnership, which is that the Limited partners don't have personal liability if things go very bad with the company. They're only liable to lose the amount they've put in if you're a limited partner. That's the same thing for a, a manager managed LLC and frankly for a member managed LLC. So getting to the concept of liability protection, um, corporate shareholders can only lose the extent of their investment, right? If something bad happens at the corporate level, it's highly unlikely that a lawsuit against the shareholders that would then attach against the shareholders' other assets would be uh, successful. Um, so limited liability is the point of these forming these entities of an LLC or a corporation or a limited partnership. Traditionally, there was a thing called a general partnership too, which is simply the association in business of two or more persons or entities. And a general partnership is merely formed, not by any filing with the Secretary of State, but simply by doing business together with someone. You are automatically deemed to be in a general partnership. And under common law, general partners are personally liable. So you never want to be in a general partnership because it's very easy, easy enough to instead form an LLC. And, and the distinction between general partnership and sole proprietorship is the definition of a sole proprietor is simply any person, live human being, who engages in commerce and business. The moment, and that gets to kind of John's question, which is, I think that was his, maybe I'm misremembering, but the point is, if you want to be a sole proprietor, that just means are you doing something out there in commerce in exchange for money? Are you providing a service? Are you selling a product? If you have, and you've done nothing else in terms of the formalities, you're a sole proprietor. 
You don't need to do anything else. Now, whether that's a wise idea, I don't generally think it is because it's easy enough to form an LLC and become a single member LLC. And then if you operate that thing properly, and I can tell you about the formalities of operating an LLC, if you operate it property, properly, then if something bad happens, somebody gets hurt, somebody sues you for products liability, uh, whatever, defective um, design, somebody slips and falls on your premises, um, your, your driver who's delivering stuff hits somebody, sends them to the hospital, all that stuff. If you're a sole proprietor, pretty much all of your personal assets are at risk. Now, there is a list that I could probably dig up of assets that if somebody gets sued, somebody personally gets sued, that a creditor, a judgment creditor in a lawsuit cannot take from you. And so I, the, the list is the basics. They can't take your glasses. They can't take other health aids. You know, I mean, that would be cruel. So there's a list of things they can't take from you. They can't take from you, I think, a certain amount of equity in your primary residence in your home. So there's just a list of untouchable assets, but uh, you don't wanna rely on that because that can basically take almost everything else. Uh, so ideally, you know, you never really wanna just be a sole proprietor in my opinion, because it's easy enough to form an LLC and operate through the LLC. Um, let's see. Um, never want to be a sole proprietor. Likewise, you never want, if you're doing business with a friend or a business partner, you never want to be a general partnership. You two ought to form an LLC and operate with the formalities necessary uh, to get the benefit of, of liability protection so that certainly the LLC can get sued and lose any asset it has, but at least they can't go beyond that to what's in your savings account. Um, and so again, you form an LLC. But now I've been alluding to how to operate the thing so that the law respects the difference between you and this paper entity that you've created. Well, first, the formation formalities are important. So, so formality matters in uh, ensuring that the law will respect this distinction between you and this paper entity you've created. Formalities matter. So proper formation. If you don't do proper formation, a court could find that you weren't really an LLC because you didn't properly format, form it. Now, what is proper formation? Proper formation typically is <clears throat> filing a good set of articles of organization. These are terms of art. These are jargon in LLC speak. Filing a good set of articles of organization at the Vermont Secretary of State's office. And of course, paying the filing fee of $125 to the Vermont Secretary of State and obtaining a certificate of organization as a result from the Vermont Secretary of State so it's a nice little piece of paper. Certificate of organization of 123 Main Street LLC or ABC Window Washing LLC. Um, so then you've got your certificate, you've got your articles. Now here's the next thing that those who form their own LLCs often miss. It's called the operating agreement. It's the agreement that says things like, who owns this thing? And who's the manager of this thing? And some other, what I'll call legal mumbo jumbo, some legal terms uh, that are important. I'm not discounting them, but it just, it, you know, to the uninitiated, it kind of looks like, you know, just a bunch of legal chants that says this is what you're supposed to do. And in fact, I got a copy of an operating agreement that I often use for for single member LLCs. I mean, that might be kind of absurd to you uh, as a practical matter to think, wait a second, the manager and the member are the same person. Why do they need a, an agreement between themselves and the LLC? That's kind of loony. But remember, formalities matter. So it's always a good idea to have an operating agreement, even when you're the sole owner. And the kinds of things that go in the operating agreement, section one, it recites who is the owner. 
Section two, um, where's your principal place of business? Section three, recite some legal language that the member shall uh, keep books and records, will not commingle assets with the member's individual funds. The member um, uh, does not borrow money or other assets or lend money or other assets except on an arm's length basis. Trying to keep up the formalities that this company is different from you, that you're not using it just as your alter ego. Next, um, uh, that you use best efforts, that the company's cash and other assets are reasonably sufficient to enable the company to meet its obligations. Um, when you sign, this is, this, this is sort of a checklist of things that are really the formalities and it's embedded in an operating agreement that when you, it's kind of to, to remind the sole, the, the sole member, but it says that in dealing with third parties, here's how you sign. Because if you sign contracts, just your own name, then you're not operating as an LLC. You're supposed to sign it this way. You're supposed to sign it name of LLC in all caps. And then next line, the word by, B-Y colon, and then put an underline. And that's where you sign. And then underneath that underline, you say by Jeff Wick, it's managing member. So if that, that if I owned my own LLC and I were signing for the LLC, it would say, you know, ABC LLC by Jeff Wick, it's managing member. If you've signed that way, you've respected the formalities because now the world knows that they're not deal dealing with Jeff Wick individually and they're not making decisions as to whether they want the deal, you know, risk, risk decisions, credit decisions. Uh, they know they're dealing with Jeff's LLC. And if they know that the law presumes that they also know that if things go wrong, that they're not going to be able to sue Jeff individually, but they can certainly sue his LLC. Um, and then what else? What else is important in this operating agreement? Oh, hey, Jeff, can, I just, can I just break in with a quick question for you on yeah. that? Yeah. So um, there, when you say you sign that way, are you saying that's the, the way people would sign in all correspondence that they have within their business? Or is that specifically when they it's sign? Legal documents. Their legal, legal documents, documents. contracts, okay. agreements, leases, that sort of thing. Gotcha. Thank you. Like in an informal letter, you could just sign your name and you could put managing member. You know, you're identifying your role, just like if you were a vice president of a company. In an informal letter, you sign Jeff Wick, vice president. What about on checks? Uh, checks, you just, well, actually, some commercial checks actually have pre-printed language underneath the signature block that might say um, duly authorized agent. They may or may not. I don't think that's critical. Critical. If it, it is true, actually, that speaking of that, thank you for bringing that up. When you're an LLC, one of the formalities is to immediately, once you form that LLC, go to the bank, yeah. open up a bank account in the name of the LLC. And incidentally, it's better if you've also obtained a federal tax ID number and bring that to the bank too. And they use your federal tax ID number and associate that with that bank account. And the bank account is not in the name of Jeff Wick, it's in the name of ABC LLC. And then they have a little form that says who are the authorized signers that the bank keeps and it says okay. Jeff Wick. And then they'll issue you checks and you can go ahead and sign the darn checks, just, just Jeff Wick. Because the, you know, the header on the upper left-hand portion of the check will not say Jeff Wick, it'll say ABC LLC. So, yeah, Dan. Uh, so does the operating agreement need to be submitted to the Secretary of State or is this oh, just something that's held internally? That's held internally. And I suppose uh, it's held internally as a, as a guide to oneself if you're the sole member. If you have multiple members, it's held internally um, as a guide to the group as to what the agreements were. Who's the manager? Under what circumstances, um, you know, can money be borrowed? Um, is it majority vote? Is it super majority vote on any on certain decisions? Yeah. So I should say that a multi-member LLC operating agreement is much more robust than a single member LLC operating agreement. Uh, I'd compare it to say 10 pages single spaced for a multi-member to maybe three pages single spaced for a single member operating agreement. But they're important because the multi-member LLC agreements 
also contain things like, what if I can't stand my partner and I want out or I want him out? What the hell are we supposed to do now? Well, it contains certain provisions that are supposed to guide you in a breakup. So kind of think of it as a uh, prenup agreement. It sort of provides procedural ways of getting out and buying out. What if you want to sell your interest? And, and actually, most small businesses contain clauses in their operating agreements. And this is why if you're a multi-member LLC, it is absolutely critical to have an operating agreement. Absolutely critical. Because in there, it typically says a bunch of things about, hey, look, the only reason we're doing this is because we're in business together. Neither of us has the right, uh, except under this procedure down below, which I'm not going to get into. It's kind of complicated. Has the right to sell our interest to some third party. And if we do, we for, I mean, the right actually says, well, you first have to offer it, offer it to the other members because it's sort of implied that in a small business, no one should be freely selling their, own, their ownership to some unknown third party who's not a friend or not a business colleague or someone you don't want to do business with. You want to tie up as much as you legally can the rights of sale, the rights to what we call alienate your interest uh, because, you know, you're sort of a joint venture, you're sort of partners, you know, and things can get pretty tempting uh, as the business grows and things get more valuable. So you want to have, yeah, go ahead, Dan. Just a quick follow up to that. So when you, we just filed for a new LLC, we kind of like rebooted our LLC because more people had joined and the previous LLC had been muddied up by like other businesses that were sort of like, my partner was using it as like a single member LLC and not really like handling the tax stuff accordingly. And so I was like, we should have a fresh break, new LLC, new bank account, like reboot the business. I'm not sure if that was the right move or not. What were we supposed to submit any documents when we filed the LLC? I know there was a place to like attach things, but in the past I've tried to attach an operating agreement and it didn't, they rejected it. Well the operating so, agreement is a private agreement between the members and managers. So what would I need to upload, if anything, or nothing? Well, when you form an LLC on the Vermont Secretary of State's uh, page, um, there are a bunch of fields that you fill in. And you fill in those fields, and you pay money, and you hit submit. OK, cool. That's what that's we not, but, but remember, that's not complete formation of the LLC. That is. If a lawyer, I mean, I'll just put it this way. If a lawyer formed an LLC for you and never gave you an operating agreement, that's malpractice. If you form an LLC and you don't have an operating agreement, I think that's foolish. So the operating agreement is the key document when push comes to shove as to who owns it, you know, oh, how do you make decisions about important company matters and how do you break up? Jeff, a question in on that in that field there. If you're if you're if you're going into business with multiple people in the LLC, would you be likely just be working together with one lawyer on this, or would you ideally have your own lawyer representing you in the process? I mean, what's what's kind of realistic? Well, typically, when people are going in sort of in equal shares, and they're all contributing, just you know, an equal amount of cash, because that's the other thing you. You want to contribute money at the outset. That's your starting capital. If you don't contribute money ever, you know, question, unless you, the company's immediately generated a bunch of revenue, but you should at least contribute a dollar, but you should really contribute what the necessary starting or operating capital is to get the thing off the ground. Um, Sammy, and what was that question again? Because I think I got off track. Oh, uh, oh, sorry. I was asking um, if if people are going to be going into oh, business. Yeah. Starting more more than, than one lawyer. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, most people, if they come to me, the two or three people who are all equal partners with an equal contribution, they don't need more than one lawyer. I do tell them that they that um, it's, it's, you know, lawyers own ethical rules are really a little arcane and, and quirky. So I, I definitely have to tell them that they each have a right to their own lawyer, that I cannot represent the interest of more than one person or entity. And so it's actually a little unclear under legal ethics 
whether I am representing more than one entity uh, and whether I can or should represent more than one person in the formation of an LLC. But as a practical matter, nobody wants to multiply the legal fees by three. So I say they can and you know, seriously consider it, but that um, I'm willing to sort of represent the interests of the group, but to the extent the group then starts fighting among themselves, everybody acknowledges that I then have to withdraw and can't represent any of them in a fight. So Jeff, just a, a follow up to this. <clears throat> um, as I mentioned at the outset, you know, a lot of our clients are a very scant resources, which is why they're working with us. Yeah. Um, but regarding an operating agreement, I mean, I I've told some clients when they've asked me about operating agreements, I've said, look, it, it's, it's really boils down to what you decide amongst yourselves and addressing a lot of the points that you made. Um, what do you do when you when you break up? Who who has do you have 50 50 share or what determine the, the shares? The point is that you document it and you sign that document. Mm -hmm. That's that's really the key. It's not not so much that you have a lawyer, but it, but you have a written agreement that you all have signed on to. I mean, yes, true. And if someone just does not have the money to pay a lawyer to do a good operating agreement. What you suggest is better than nothing, because ultimately one should always think in a dispute, where's the evidence? Where's the evidence of who owns it? Where's the evidence of who of the decision making authority? And, and you know, is there any agreement on sort of breaking up? And so I suppose in plain English, if someone absolutely cannot afford a lawyer, it's better to put that all out there. Um, but in a perfect world, it's better to have an operating agreement that covers all bases that a, a trained lawyer knows how to prepare. Okay. But, but yeah, I get it. Not everyone can afford a lawyer. And uh, actually, Simeon came up with a great idea, or at least he brought it up to me the other day. And I hope it works out, which is uh, maybe he'll contact the Vermont Bar Association and see if he can start some kind of pilot program of retired business lawyers who might wanna provide heavily discounted or free legal advice to micro businesses. That's a great idea. Simeon, is that your idea of the year? It's been my idea for the year for the last few years. <laughs> <laughs> um, Jeff, I, I just wanna circle around on, on a couple of things. Um, uh, one, just to clarify, um, when you're going back to your statement about um, using um, federal employer identification number when you're setting up a, um, a bank account. Um, so there's that process, but would the other option be if somebody is a, like a sole proprietor, they would use their social security number instead? Is that is that true? Just to, if they're not oh, using- Yeah, let me address yeah. that. Yeah. So first, if you're a sole proprietor, you have no choice but to use your own social security number and associate that with your business, with your bank account, with uh, 1099s, with whatever else. But you know, in this day and age of social security number fraud, that's yet another reason not to operate as a sole proprietor. If you operate as an LLC, you can very easily obtain a federal tax ID number so that all the stuff that the world sees, your public facing, business does not involve your, so your own individual social security number. I think it's a very good idea for that reason as well. And incidentally, uh, it is very easy to get a federal tax ID number, as you probably know, because the IRS offers an online free service. Now, as with everything, should you have a lawyer to do it? Not necessarily, but only, well, but if you're going to do it your own, on yourself, by yourself, just make sure you do it right. That's the key. And that's why, that's the essential distinction why a lawyer is quote unquote necessary uh, in many things. Not because the law says a lawyer is necessary, not at all. It's because if you wanna do it right, oftentimes it's the, you know, it, it, I know I'm beating a dead horse here maybe, but um, it's like if my house here needs some plumbing work, there's no way I'm gonna do that on my own or electrical work. 
even though it's going to cost me if I possibly can afford it, obviously and I can't afford it. And I, I'll figure out maybe how to jerry rig it. But, um, but the thing is, if you hire a professional to do it, presumably it'll be done right. And if something goes wrong, you can go back to that professional and say, you messed up and I'd like you to fix it. Or, but in the first place, you get a high degree of confidence that's been done right, which is the important part. Dan? Is there any real difference between a sole proprietor bank account and just like a regular personal checking account? Like, does the bank even have a distinction? I think they do. I think okay. they have personal checking and business checking. And on the topic of a sole proprietor, as you know, um, most people, even if they're a sole proprietor and they haven't formed an LLC, they still want to operate with some kind of a trade name, some kind of a fictitious name for their business, right? Which is good. Um, so what a sole proprietor does to, to, to make that official is registers with the Vermont Secretary of State for a trade name or a fictitious name is what the Secretary of State's office actually calls it if you go online. And so typically it'll be like, if my fictitious name is ABC Business, then, uh, and I'm the sole proprietor, Jeff Wick goes to the Vermont Secretary of State's website, registers the fictitious trade name, ABC Business. And then I take that certificate, the trade name certificate, and I take it to the bank. And I say, look, I'm operating this business. I'd like to open up a business account. I'm the sole proprietor. And then they operate what, I mean, they open what they call, I think, like a business checking account. And typically business checking accounts in some banks are more expensive and personal accounts. And you'll find that theme throughout, which is the society presumes if you're operating a business, you know, you're not going to get as much protections as a consumer, an individual personal consumer doing your own personal business. So oftentimes business bank accounts can maybe cost a little more than a personal checking account. So, so you could have a trade name even as a sole proprietor, but obviously you recommend taking that trade name and just forming the LLC under the trade name as a single member instead of having like a fictitious name as a sole proprietor? So for example, I mean, generally, yes, but I want to make sure that I correct maybe one thing that you said, which is you don't form the, well, actually, I think you probably, I think I understood what you said. What you do, yes, is the answer. But if you form a, if you file for a fictitious trade name under your own name, Jeff Wick files for ABC Business. Jeff Wick is the sole proprietor doing business as ABC Business. But instead, if I decide I want to do that through an LLC, the first thing I do is form the LLC, ABC Business LLC. And then ABC Business LLC registers the fictitious name ABC Business. And that's a little tiny bit arcane, but I do think it's important because you always want to think from the perspective of if somebody tries to sue the business, they're going to make every argument they can think of to get at your personal assets because you'll have been wise enough to remove the excess cash from your LLC whenever there is excess cash. So whenever somebody sues your LLC, there's never going to be anything there except maybe some equipment, recording equipment or whatever. But they're not going to be a lot of cash. <laughs> so they're always going to try to get at you individually. And they're going to say, well, look, Look at his business card. Look at his website. Look at his letterhead. None of that says LLC. It just says ABC Business. Well, if you've been smart enough to have your LLC file for the trade name, ABC Business, then your defense is a judge. We all know that the Vermont Secretary of State's website is, is constructive notice to all of humanity as to, how, as to whom they're doing business with. And you can see on the website of the Secretary of State, the ABC Business was a trade name of ABC Business LLC. And therefore, the plaintiff cannot be heard to say that he thought he was dealing with me as a sole proprietor when notice to the world he was dealing with the LLC, which owned the trade name. Does that make sense? It does make sense. I'm just confused about the order that I would set it up. Like, I have. Part with the LLC. So the LLC would, so like, let's say that, uh, so I have Dan Rome, I have my own recording business that I operate as myself. Then I also have a recording studio that people will hire the studio, which then hires me. So there's Future Fields Studios, LLC, and Dan Rome, sole proprietor. 
So I want to get from Dan Rome, sole proprietor, to having some sort of like fictitious name. Maybe let's call it like, um, you know, like Recording Industries or whatever. So I, I have Dan Recording Industries. How do I go from the sole proprietorship that I have right now to having this secondary business so that when Future Fields hires me to do the recording, they're actually hiring Dan Recording Industries? Yeah. Well, Dan Recording Industries maybe forms an LLC called Dan Recording Industries LLC. Okay. So I just go on, I file, so it's, that's, that's just filing a single member LLC. Yeah. Okay. So I filed a single member LLC, but I don't really need to address anything of the sole proprietorship or. Well, because there, there won't be one anymore. So when you file as Dan Recording Industries, that's what you're saying of the LLC filing for the trade name. Well, but so for, no, your example is a good one. And I think it's, it's, it's not just specific to you. I think it's specific yeah. generically to everything we're talking about. So what you would do is even though you're operating as a sole proprietor now, you decide what is the name under which you'd like to operate this as an LLC. And then you go and you form the LLC. And then once you have formed the LLC, step two is the LLC perhaps files the trade name, which is the same as the LLC's name minus LLC. And then what's the point of all that? The point of all that is you never have to put on your marketing material LLC because notice is given to the world that the trade name is owned by an LLC, which is, happens to be owned by you. But. And where do you get that trade name registered? Vermont Secretary of State's website. Okay, well, we talked a lot about sole props and LLCs. Um, we kind of touched on tips on separating yourself from your business by proper formation and proper operation. And why do you want to separate yourself so that if somebody sues your business, they can't also claim uh successfully to, to sue you individually and separating yourself from the business involves proper formation of an llc proper operating of an llc what does that mean that means opening that bank account in the name of the llc it means when you need to well the initial capital contribution or subsequent capital contributions you write from your own personal checkbook, you write it payable to the LLC and you deposit it into the LLC's checking account. And in the little memo line, you put capital contribution. That shows that you've respected the formality, the separation between you and the, and the business. You're funding the business. Now, once the money's in the business, when the business has expenses, do your very best never to pay those expenses out of your own personal checkbook. Pay it out of the business's checkbook. And incidentally, if you're using like a software program like Quicken or QuickBooks, um, if you do all of your, put all your revenues into the business checkbook, pay all your expenses out of that check, checking account rather, uh, and, you, and you enter all that revenue and expenses in Quicken or QuickBooks, then it becomes really easy to track your, how you're doing for operating purposes and also for tax purposes. So those are important formalities. The other important formalities I discussed is properly signing on behalf of the LLC, which I won't repeat. And so, yeah, those are the proper formalities, generally speaking. You also want to buy insurance. The LLC should acquire commercial insurance specific to its needs. And that's why you should see a commercial insurance agent say, here's my LLC, here's what we do. What kind of insurance do I need? Like just general commercial general liability? Are there any specific riders or endorsements that are specific to my business? Go ahead, Simeon. I was just going to ask, um, are there other examples where you would want to uh, have the, say, the business as on the contract as opposed to you? you know, for example, if you're leasing a space, who would the, who would the, the lease be in the name of? Yes, absolutely. That's another formality that's a very important one, which is when you sign a lease with the landlord for your business, make sure that the named tenant in the lease is not you, but the name of the LLC. Now, having said that, every smart landlord is going to say, well, that's fine, but here's a personal guarantee that I want you to sign. And in fact, when you get a bank loan, 
for the LLC. The bank's going to say, that's fine, but here's a personal guarantee that I want you to sign. So, so for relationships like that, the entrepreneur is unfortunately going to have to put their entire net worth at risk. Just, uh, just to clarify um, about the uh, federal uh, EIN um, identification number you mentioned earlier, uh, is there any difference between what a lawyer would, would do in terms of helping somebody get that versus what somebody would do on their own? Well, I can to... tell you that if I do it, or someone who has equivalent skills, they do it right. Because okay. there's a series of questions that you have to answer. Mm -hmm. And if you're just an entrepreneur doing it, as long as you do it right, there's no difference. But you might not know some of the jargon. You might not select some of the right fields. So, I mean, also an accountant can do it. It doesn't have to be a lawyer. And you can do it yourself if you, you know, like anything, if you study hard enough, you can do it. Thanks. Okay. Um, Rachel, any questions or thoughts or not right now? You good. good. I'm just listening right now, but thank Excellent. you. No problem. I just want to make sure, you know. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, Somebody had their hand up. Oh, um, okay. Sorry if I missed it. No, that. no, no, it's okay. It came through in the chat. Um, uh, Chris Anthonum, sorry, Chris Anthonum. Uh, uh, I'm currently a sole proprietor of an art business. I really don't have any assets. I rent and don't own a car. I only make like $10,000 a year for my art. I also have craft show liability insurance. Is there any benefit to forming an LLC if I already have that insurance and I don't have assets um, I could be sued for? So I, I take it Chrysanthemum is an artist, right? And Chrysanthemum's yes, that, product is, is art. Yes, that's, that's correct. Yeah, sells art. People buy art. I I tend to agree with you that as long as you've got some liability insurance for anything that someone might sue you about, I don't know, like you said, I don't necessarily think an artist needs to form an LLC. But if you were to start kind of, I don't know, mass producing stuff and I don't know, it gets more complicated. Maybe if it looks more like a business, then do it. But an individual artist, I would, I would, I'm not sure I would form an LLC if I were the artist under your circumstances. Thank you. Sure. Does what, anybody what's know? the argument for not forming the LLC as the as an artist in that circumstance? Well, you're right. That's a good question. I didn't say why, did I? Uh, I was just thinking, you know, I mean, what I'm not sure Chrysanthemum is entering into any contracts with other people. Maybe Chrysanthemum is selling artwork in exchange for money. I'm just trying to think, and I could be wrong. I'm not seeing a lot of potential liability there. Like, you know, but slip and fall stuff at, a, at an exhibit maybe, I suppose, is a bit of a stretch because she doesn't own the space. Uh, or, I'm sorry, if I mess up any pronouns, I'm gonna forgive in advance. So if Chrysanthemum doesn't own the space. Um, yeah, so I, I, you know, it's a, it's a facts and circumstances analysis. And so I, I could be wrong if there's something I'm missing here, but. Uh... Uh, Jeff, um, uh, Robert had a question I'd like to read to you here. If you're okay for me to continue, is there anything else you wanted to say on that last topic? No, I'm good. Okay, okay. So Robert asks, um, I've registered my business name, um, as an LLC with the Secretary of State. What about my logo? Is there a federal trademark issue? Oh boy. Now, there is a whole ginormous specialized area of the law called intellectual property law. Copyrights, trademarks, patents. You know, intellectual property is, uh, well, copyrights, think of it as, I don't know, books is a good example, as you know. Patents, you know, special processes that you can patent or special drugs. I mean, there are all kinds of patents. Uh, so everyone kind of intuitively knows that copyrights, patents, trademarks, that's the third kind. You know, if you, if your trademark is 
Coca-Cola, but it's spelled K-O-K-A-C-O-L-A, I think you intuitively know you got a problem, right? You're not going to be able to use Coca-Cola just spelled slightly differently. So, but in general, that is highly specialized and I won't wade into that, nor am I an expert in that. But the question ultimately is usually, how do I know and how can I maybe lock up my right to use a certain trade name or to have a certain piece of artwork that includes my trade name as the logo? And how do I know that that's different enough from other trade names or trademarks in the stream of commerce? either in, let's say, Chittenden County or Vermont or New England or the United States or the entire world. And it turns out it's a highly complex analysis. I never tell my clients whether I can't give them an opinion as to whether somebody's going to challenge their use or selection of a name. Um, there are third-party services, companies, who traditionally do trade name searches. And I'm sure if you Googled like trade name search provider, you'd probably find a bunch. But what I generally tell my client, it, get, it can get very complicated when you're doing business like selling goods or services online because immediately your entire, the entire world is your customer base. And so it may be true that others have a very similar name. So I always say, look, just start with the deepest Google search you can to figure out if there's a conflicting name. And if so, and you wanna talk about it, let me know, I'll at least give you my preliminary thoughts. But I know a guy at a much bigger law firm who charges a lot of money who can help you with trademarking and trade name sort of determinations if it really matters to your business. You know, like if you're about to launch some big um, or not even big, but some Vermont-based hard liquor distillery, right? It's probably super important that you aren't expending a lot of money on your logo or your name unless you've done enough work and perhaps even attempted to federally trademark your name. And that can take years. That can take a year or two to go through the federal trademarking process and can cost thousands of dollars in legal fees. And so, but basically most of the clients that I deal with, they sort of hope for the best. They do the Google search the best they can and wing it. And, you know, there's a possibility that occasionally one or two might in the last 20 years that I've been practicing have gotten a cease and desist letter from some larger company that thinks it has prior rights to use that name in that area of commerce, in that geographical location than my client. And, you know, I always tell my clients, look, you know, just prepare for that eventuality. And if you can't stomach that eventuality, then cough up a lot more dough and I'll send you over to a, a trademark attorney. And you can really try to get everything properly trademarked. Most people don't. And this is uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but isn't there an option of the Vermont Secretary of State to register a trademark through the state, or am I wrong? Well, there's a trade name registration, and the Vermont Secretary of State will only query its own database to see if there's a confusingly similar name, but that doesn't give you any assurance that some other company in some other state or country uh, ha doesn't have prior rights. So there is the, if you go onto the U.S. Patent and Trademark uh, USPTO.gov, I think it is, their website. If you're curious, you can spend a lot of time on there learning a lot of fascinating stuff about um, patents, trademarks, and copyright. And there's actually even an online process to apply for your uh, trademark, but it's, it's not trivial. And um, I'd probably recommend having a lawyer who specializes in that do that for you. You can always try, though. Uh, Jeff, just a... Uh, do you mind if I transition to some other questions? This Go for it. Okay. Uh, so just a couple of follow-up questions in terms of establishing one's business as an LLC. Um, I'm wondering if you're able to touch on 
what you think a, a realistic range is that lawyers might charge for yeah. that service. And, yeah. and I know we've been focused on starting one, but can you also talk about what it's like to dissolve one or and or a, um, a sole proprietor as well? Yeah. Well, there's no real dissolving of a sole proprietor because again, a sole proprietor is just an individual choosing to do business. And when you stop doing business, there's no, no, there's no paper entity that you need to dissolve. There may be things that you need to button up, you know, work on terminating your lease with your landlord, get out of there cleanly, um, work on uh, filing any final uh, tax returns, sales and use tax, all kinds of sort of stuff with the Vermont Department of Taxes and the IRS, all kinds of stuff to button up if you've had employees uh, to kind of get that buttoned up with the state and local you know, departments of labor, the IRS, all kinds of stuff that thankfully accountants and payroll companies help you with if you're, you know, but, um, but in terms of dissolving an LLC or a corporation, that's not too hard from a legal standpoint. Uh, you just want to make sure you, you know, the business is really wound up and there's a provision of enough money left for any creditors who may be out there that the creditors get paid. And because you have to certify to that stuff in your articles of dissolution at the Vermont Secretary of State's office. That's dissolution. I think you also, what, what was your other question about form, the formation side of that? Did you have? Oh, I, I just asked if you could give a sense to folks about what's the cost. Like range to pay cost. Over. Yeah. Cost. yeah. Well, it it depends. And it can depend greatly on the simplicity or complexity of what the client brings to the table. I always hope for simplicity because I've found that some people, not all, tend to come in, they overcomplicate things, and it's really just this elaborate structure. It's like I try to cut through it and say, all right, is this what you're really asking? But so in the case where a person comes to me and says, look, this is my, I don't know, technology consulting business. Right now it's just me. I might hire people, I might not, but I just wanna operate under the name of an LLC. It looks more professional. Colleagues of mine do it too. And so can you help me with that? And, and so what that typically costs, it's a formation of a single member LLC. Um, I will use a sliding scale. I'll be quite honest with you. I will look at how micro or not the business is. It's just fair that way. So, uh, and, 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 I, and I tend to do that in other areas like wills and trusts. Um, if somebody's situation is very, very modest, I can't justify my usual fee. So can I do it for less? I, I often, I will, I will adjust it for the appropriate circumstances. But it just so happens that usually the people with the complex circumstances that charge more have the money to pay retail, if you will. And the people who just have very, you know, humble needs don't need a lot of complexity anyhow. And so it's naturally less expensive. But in terms of a range, if you're just kind of middle of the pack, if you will, coming to form an LLC, uh, just remember, what's not negotiable is the Vermont Secretary of State's fee, and that's 125 bucks. And um, my fee, I'll often charge just sort of a flat fee of 750 for forming a single member LLC. Occasionally, I'll knock that down to five or 550. There have been cases where I have knocked it down even lower, depending on the circumstances. You know, if it's a guy starting a food cart, which is this is a real circumstance. And he was just trying to get started, whatever. I mean, I, I think I said, well, what can you afford? You know, so um, it depends. But a multi-member LLC, when you got business partners and there's usually more complexity, um, usually my starting rate, starting rate, meaning if it gets more complex then it's more, but if it looks pretty straightforward, the whole formation set, I typically charge 950 for that. And again, there's on top of that's $125 to the Vermont Secretary of State. Thank you, Jeff. Sure. 
Um, did you want to transition to some other topics unless anybody else has a follow up question to what we've been discussing? Sure, absolutely. All right, I'm going to assume that um, <clears throat> silence means good to proceed. Um, so can you talk about um, what somebody should be looking for when, say, they're shopping for a lawyer? It's kind of somewhat on topic, but um, is there anything that you would recommend people do as part of that process or specific questions to ask? Yeah, I think good fit is important, you know, just as in any business or humanity, people have different personalities. You want to find a reasonably decent fit. You want to find somebody who you feel comfortable with. And so, yeah, um, how you first find that subset of lawyers, I, I don't know. <laughs> Go online, look up Burlington, Vermont business lawyer. See what comes up, right? Maybe I'll come up. Maybe uh, a couple other folks will come up from, let's say, larger firms. So, you know, it depends on what you're comfortable with. Um, do you like mahogany panels on the wall? Do you like flesh, fresh flowers um, on the side tables? Look at my shirt. <laughs> That's not me. They're friends of mine. But, you know, do you want to pay for teams of associates at very high rent and a lake, lake view from the fifth or sixth floor of a gorgeous building? It depends on your personality. Some people do. They're like, you know what? I would rather go. And, and honestly, I have a great deal of respect for the larger firms and, and they play an important role, but they tend to handle uh, much larger transactions, 10 million, 50 million, 100 million, even smaller, but still, you know, so essentially and there are guys who kind of operate at my level as well, sort of practitioners of, in small firms. Right now, there are two lawyers in our firm. I run our Essex office. My father runs our Burlington office. We used to have five or six lawyers, but you know, over time, one retired, a few left, and we just, I don't feel like I need it right now. I, I do need, I need someone else when my dad retires, but uh, in any event, so, and, and you get price differentials that way. So you kind of have to just maybe call a few, <clears throat> see if they'll at least meet with you over the telephone and or in person, you know? I always offer at least, a, well, pre-COVID, I always offered like a free initial consult in, in person. You know, I don't want to waste too much of their time nor they mine. So I'd say, look, you know, come in, let's find a time. We'll talk for 15 or 20 minutes. You can ask some questions and I'll probably have a better idea of what your need is. And then I can give you kind of an estimate. But since COVID, you know, there's a period where nobody meets in person. So Zoom is helpful, but I've found that uh, I do a lot more stuff by telephone, actually. Um, and so we've had to meet less. But anyway, so, but the point is find a good fit. Don't know, just got a kind of an intuitive thing. Does a guy look, does a guy sound like he knows what he's talking about? You know. Is it, is it reasonable to ask, hey, do you have experience it, with this kind of business? Oh, uh, I mean, that's, you know, that's just, yeah. that's just, that's a starting point. Yeah. Okay. And um, is it is it a good idea to just to confirm um, if the first meeting is if there's a fee for that? Oh, absolutely. Look, hey, you offer a free initial consultation just to kind of meet and greet. You know, mm -hmm. okay. I don't think people. I mean, they'll end up getting a little bit of insight and legal advice, quote for free. Mm -hmm. But most people, thankfully, don't expect like you know like serious work, like where I have to go do legal research, provide a memo to them. You know, so they know that. So yeah, meet and greet, handshake. We, we're each trying each other out. Is this kind of someone I can do, I can, I can have as a client? Is this someone I'd like to have as a client? You know, I, I, I personally went through that process when I was looking to start a business. I'd made a point of visiting three different lawyers and three different accountants. And yeah. you know, I, I find myself suggesting people do that because you 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 actually learn quite a bit and you yeah. get to evaluate their personalities. And you yeah. know, I could confirm that well, they they all seem to have the same general knowledge, but from a personality standpoint, I really don't want to work with this person. I'd much yeah. prefer this person. Yeah. So 
Absolutely. It's worth it. It's worth Spot the process. Yep. Yeah. Um, Jeff, uh, how about, um, would you mind talking about asset protection and protecting wealth? Some of that, that, that. Yes. Topic we just touched on yes. the other day. And that, that's kind of tied in, frankly, with just what we already talked about primarily, which is if you're doing business, do it as an LLC, properly form it, properly operate it, and properly insure your business. And that's about as much as you can do. Um, however, just sort of incidentally, uh, once you know there's a claim against you, if you start moving the chips around, and this is, doesn't have anything to do with the LLCs, but this is more like individually. If you know that somebody now has made it known that they have some kind of legal claim against you, that might cost you money. And then as a result of that, you start retitling your assets. Say to your brother, look, uh, can, I, uh, can, I, can I give you a deed to my home for a while and then you'll give it back to me after the smoke clears? Or, hey, look, uh, can I put uh, everything into my wife's name? That doesn't work because um, there's a doctrine called fraudulent conveyance or fraudulent transfer. And so the law is smart enough to know that. But if you do things before there's a claim, like, for example, the most common thing is if you're married and you're doing business, I mean, I'm doing business, right? I'm a lawyer. I'm actually, quote, unquote, I'll just call it doing business, right? We're all doing business. Whatever we do for a living is business. So turns out lawyers and other highly, you know, academically trained professionals, lawyers, doctors, engineers, others, there's a doctrine in the law that says that we are personally liable, no matter what, for our errors and omissions, for our mistakes, for our negligence. And that's pretty scary. We actually can't use the things that I'm suggesting to you guys, which is LLCs, corporations, limited liability entities to protect our own assets. It's a much scarier, I can tell you that, to operate as one of these licensed professionals where you cannot, quote, hide behind a paper entity. So obviously what we do is we, we buy insurance, malpractice insurance, it helps everybody. If we do make a mistake, thankfully there's an insurance company who's going to pay out the claim. Um, and, you know, we pay a lot of money to keep an insurance policy in place. But so that's really good asset protection insurance. But the other thing is, is even if you're not a lawyer or whatever, any kind of business you're in, if you're married, what you want to do is uh, put all of your savings, your excess net worth into, um, into an account that is titled specifically um, yourself and your spouse, husband and wife is tenants by the entirety or wife and wife or husband and husband, whatever. But the point is it's a marital form of ownership. Um, and that has a special legal significance in that money titled that way or real estate titled that way is not considered to be my money nor my wife's money. It's the marital money and if somebody gets a big judgment against me for doing business in some way, uh, and it turns out they can attach all of my assets, they can't attach what I've got in the marital form of ownership. So that's the, that's the easiest, best way to do asset protection if you're married. If you're not, there aren't really a lot of options. And I'm not sure, Simeon, if that's the kind of thing you had in mind when you asked a question. Insurance is the ultimate uh, way to protect yourself. Okay, great. Well, it, it wasn't, but that was certainly interesting to learn about. Um, yeah. And Robert is asking, uh, has a question, children question mark. So I guess he's wondering if what, Robert, does that apply to your one's children? <clears throat> Maybe focus that question a bit. Yes, I'm, I'm sorry. I meant, I understand completely what you said about spouses. Can you do that with adult children? No, it's only the marital form of co-ownership. Okay, thank you. Um, you. You brought it up in your introduction, uh, 
Jeff, I'm wondering if you can just share with people um, that might benefit from this uh, as a recording, uh, what are some uh, points to consider if they're buying a business or selling a business, since I know you do work with that side of things? Oh, definitely hire a lawyer. <laughs> if you're buying a business or selling a business, there's typically enough involved that um, you know, you'll need it. It's kind of like in real estate. It's virtually impossible. I've not seen it, not seen it done. I can't imagine it would be done right. It's too technical. To, to do it right, just like buying and selling real estate, you know, the key thing is, is engage a lawyer. If you've, got a, if you've developed a business that's valuable enough that somebody wants to buy it from you, great. Get a lawyer. They'll help you with the aspects, which I'll talk about in a minute. Same thing if you're buying a business. If you're, if you're going to spend enough money to actually buy an existing business, definitely get a lawyer. Uh, because those are complex things. You can inherit, as the purchaser of a business, you can inherit the liability of the, of the prior business. So you want to be very careful about that, get a lawyer. Um, because essentially the, the sale and the purchase of business, two sides of the same coin, right? It's one transaction. Somebody's selling, somebody's buying. Um, <clears throat> the first document, well, the first document is typically called a letter of intent. That's where the lawyers... Uh, at least I tell my client, look, when they, when they approach me, hey, look, I'm selling my business or hey, look, I'm buying a business. Will you do the contract for me? I say, yes, I will. But you know what's first is a letter of intent. That's sort of you and the counterparty, you and the buyer, you and the seller get together because you already have some idea in your mind, I'm sure, of the sale price and other key terms. Um, contingencies, you know, just whatever you have in mind, try to put that down in plain English, bullet point format, not more than one to two pages at most. Call it the, the letter of intent. It's not binding, but it helps the lawyers who then have to prepare the contract. It helps us understand the deal, the intentions of the parties. And so it starts with the letter of intent. And then typically after that, it's the attorney for the buyer who prepares something called an asset purchase agreement. And that's really the contract for the sale and purchase of the assets of the business. So there are two ways you can buy a business, likewise two ways you can sell a business. One is buying the existing stock or member interest in a corporation or LLC. Nobody does that, very rarely. Nobody does that around here when it's the businesses that we're all talking about right now, because then you definitely inherit the, the new entity inherits all the existing liability of the existing company. And you just don't want to do that. So instead, what we do is an asset purchase where the selling company is not selling its member interests or stock, it's selling the assets. So there's an asset list. What is being sold? So the seller of the business has to come up with a list. What are all the components of my business? The furniture, fixtures, and equipment, um, the inventory. What is all the stuff I may be selling? And that's a key, that's the heart of the contract. So you know what you're selling, you know what you're buying. <coughs> and then, so the buyer's buying all these assets, this package of assets, and the buyer is like an LLC because the buyer's going to form an LLC as the buyer to buy the assets. So at the closing on the transaction, assuming the various contingencies have been satisfied, such as was the buyer able to get their business loan in order to be able to afford to buy this business, that sort of thing. Uh, or there's usually like a due diligence period where the buyer has the right to inspect the books and records and the operations of the business being sold. If all that's been met, then at the closing, what the seller delivers to the buyer is a bill of sale. Just like for, maybe you've seen a bill of sale when you're buying a car, selling a car or other asset. But a bill of sale that says I seller, not I seller, but I LLC seller, because they're usually LLCs, and hereby conveying to you, LLC buyer, the following assets. And I seller promise that I have, the, that I own the assets, that no one has a leaner claim on them and that I will warrant and defend that 
promise that I own them. If it turns out somebody else after says that wasn't the seller's furniture, fixtures, and equipment, that was mine, somebody else's, you know. Um, so then that's that's how it happens. And then there's a couple of like tax clearances. There's a various complications, but that's a that's a business sale in a nutshell. And Simeon, I'm not sure if I got off track there with your question. No, no, I don't think you did. Um, I'm curious, are you able to just briefly talk about goodwill, what it is? And oh, sure. How, yeah. How it was established? Yeah. Yeah. Goodwill. The goodwill of a business. So let's say like, and this, this almost always happens, when there's an existing business and somebody wants to sell and somebody wants to buy, if you think about what a business is made up of, it's really made up of physical things, tangible physical things, plus perhaps the people involved, right? And uh, ultimately, it's also made up of the business's reputation in the community. It's um, the, the, the general knowledge in its markets of the existence of that business. And so let's say you want to go buy an existing business. You're probably going to have to pay more than the fair market value of the tangible physical assets. And that something more, that premium you're paying over the value of the tables and chairs and knives and glassware and other stuff, if it's a restaurant, let's say, is called the goodwill. We also call it the going concern value because it's the <clears throat> excess value created by the, the, the business beyond the mere hard assets. Yeah, it's a fun concept. And I mean, I, would you say that, you know, that the price tag associated with that varies or is there some kind of yep. way or formula that is generated? Oh, right. So then the question becomes, well, what's a business worth? How much do I know? If, do I know, how do I know if I'm overpaying or underpaying, which would be great? How do I know if I'm overpaying? Well, basically, uh, let me just sort of think at the same time I talk here. Um, how do you value a business? Well, ultimately, uh, it comes down to a business is nothing but its expected future cash flows, right? It's expected future cash flows. So ultimately, you can abstract the business down to its expected future cash flows over time. Uh, one way you can get at, well, then, and then, all right, just to kind of finish that weird thought is how do you value expected future cash flows over time? Well, some of you might know who have studied finance or business in college or wherever. Um, essentially, you, you, you discount the cash flows into the future. Like a dollar today is worth a dollar. How much is a dollar in a year worth? Well, it turns out it's probably worth, I'm just gonna use general terms, my math's not gonna be exact, but if you could put a dollar today in a bank account and get 2% on it, uh, then in a year, that dollar today is worth a dollar two, right? A dollar and two cents. So just conversely, a dollar in a year, and again, not exact math, is probably worth 98 cents today. What's a dollar in two years worth? And again, I'm just using, bad math here, it's probably worth 96 cents today. If 2% is the interest, the general level of interest rate, what you can get on the dollar today and so on and so forth. And the interest rate assumption can change as time goes out. And usually interest rates are higher the, uh, the farther out in time. So you usually apply different interest rates, different discount rates, the farther out you go in time. That's actually the pure way, the purest way of trying to value a business is the discounted cash flow approach. Now, in reality, nobody's doing that uh, locally when you buy a business. But what you might be doing is something that is akin to that, which is to say, all right, let's think about it this way. There are two key indicators of how business is doing. First, what's its annual revenue? Is the annual revenue of business 500,000? Is it a million? Is it 10 million? And now I'm getting absurd here. Is it 100 million? You know, we don't see too many of those. But, um, the revenue and should the should the value that be a business could it be could a proxy for the value of the business be a multiple of revenues 
is it like 1.5 times annual revenues? Is that the fair market value of a business? Is it a half times revenue? And it turns out in different industries, that can be a metric. Different industries value businesses for underlying mathematical reasons, uh, some of them as a multiple of revenue, and it can be a less than one, greater than one or less than one. Uh, most of the time, well, maybe anyone where from a half, a half to one and a half times, but then the other metric you can look at to try to value a business is a multiple of of cash flow or a multiple of free cash flow or really a multiple of its uh, of its profit, right? And there are other fancy terms for that, like EBITDA, earnings before interest, taxes, depreciation, amortization. And there are other, other acronyms that you can use depending on the business. But essentially, revenue is not so relevant for some businesses, because, well, depending on the industry. Like if you're a grocery store, if your revenue is a hundred million, I'm just going to you know, what's your profit? They're very low margin businesses. They might have a profit of a million on that, a 1%. But if, you know, but other businesses have a much higher margin. So it's probably multiple revenue. You certainly can't use across different, different kinds of businesses. So maybe a multiple of, of profit. So in other words, if you were to buy, if it turned out that somebody had been operating a business for many years and every single year after they paid all their expenses, their drops to the bottom line, $100,000. So essentially what you're buying is a business that if you operate it like that, you can expect to walk away with 100,000 every year. <clears throat> what are you gonna pay for that? Is that worth 100,000? I'd buy that business today. If someone said, Jeff, every year into the future, you're gonna get $100,000. And if you pay me 100,000 today for that, you, you bought it. I'd be like, okay, I'm gonna find that money and buy it because year one, I, I got my bait back. Year one, I broke an even, year two, it's pure gravy and so on into the future. So no one's gonna pay, like 100,000 is too low. No one's gonna sell you that kind of business for 100,000. But how about 200,000? You know, so your payback is roughly speaking two years. How about 300,000? All right, so you get your bait back as they say in three years. At what point do you think it's still a good endeavor? You know, what price do you think it's still a good proposition? And as you know, there's in, in uncertainty about many aspects. Can you actually get 100,000 in free cash flow each year for a number of years? You know, this you know, maybe, yeah. So anyway, so that's kind of how you value businesses. It's, it's an art as much as a science. Thank you. I appreciate you touching on that, Jeff. It's Obviously, we can keep going down that rabbit hole, I'm sure. Yes. <laughs> Sorry, I didn't go too deeply. But no, 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 no. <laughs> um, someone posted a, a question in the chat here. This is from uh, Harrison. Uh, following up on the spouse protection measure, could an estate trust or similar mechanism substitute for a non-married individual protection? Could you repeat that one more time? I'm not sure I need to hear it a second time to understand it. Sure. And... Um, Harrison, if it's still not clear, feel free just to jump in and, and go into a little bit more detail. Uh, following up on the spouse protection measure, could an estate trust or similar mechanism substitute for a non-married individual protection? Oh, I see. Yeah, I get it. I get it. In other words, are there any other sort of tricks like, like the marital, the magical marital form of ownership as asset protection? <clears throat> um, but just to clarify some terminology, an estate is something that exists after somebody's death. So Jeff Wick owns certain assets in my, let's say I, let's say I own certain assets in my name alone, and then I die. Well, the terminology is then, <clears throat> then somebody, maybe my wife will open up a probate estate to basically settle my affairs. So, and, and that will be known as the estate of Jeff Wick. That means the dead guy's property. And so just to make the terminology a little clearer, let's take the word estate out of it because that's once you die, you have an estate. Um, but trust, a trust. I do a lot of work with trusts in the estate planning context. 
there are many, many different kinds of trust for many, many different purposes, but most for most intents, and many of them are tax driven. And so we don't, turns out most people don't need those. You have to be typically super wealthy for these fancy tax driven trusts. And you're all typically, you're tr typically trying to reduce the estate tax upon your death. But it turns out you can pass the first 5 million free of the estate tax in Vermont right now. And the first, I don't know if it's 11.3 million free of the estate tax at the federal level. So that 99.9% .9 of us do not need to worry about complex uh, tax planning trusts. So that reduces to a certain kind of trust that's very common called a revocable living trust or an inter vivos trust. And that is a substitute for a will because a will is something that gets probated. And therefore the will, you know, the will is the thing we say, upon my death, I want everything to go to my spouse if she survives me. If she doesn't, I want everything to go to my kids in equal shares. That's a will. The will has to go through the probate process, which can take up to a year, more or less. A revocable living trust is a way to get around probate. So it's often said to be less expensive, faster, so cheaper, less expensive, and, and not quite as public because the things that get published, I mean, your, your, your probate court file is to some degree a public file. Um, so these things called revocable living trusts uh, basically contain very similar language as wills, but it's a way to settle your affairs outside of probate. And you, you do them while you're alive and you change title to certain of your assets while you're alive into the name of the trust. But the law says anything that's in a revocable trust is deemed to be yours individually, both for creditor purposes and for tax purposes. So if, for example, let's say I had $100,000 and I put that into my trust and I put it in the bank account, I, I, I put it in the bank, it's in a bank earning, and I wish I could even get 2% these days, right? Now the highest, uh, for posterity, those listening many years in the future to this very video, the most you can get in a savings account right now is about 0.6 of, six tenths of 1%. And that's not much, that stinks. But well, that's my point. So um, my, my point is that even if my money is in my trust, which is in a bank account earning a paltry amount of interest, um, if I get sued and someone gets a judgment against me, they can actually go into my trust assets and have that money taken. So the, the trust doesn't, the short answer, is the trust, that kind of trust, the most common kind of trust that we see for estate planning reasons, does not have any asset protection um, at all. Now, there, I suppose you could create what's called an irrevocable trust, but it turns out nobody really wants to do that under most circumstances because to create an irrevocable trust, a trust that is not revocable, it turns out that, and, and if you, put the 100,000 in my example into it, it's no longer Jeff Wick's money. Jeff Wick doesn't have any control over it. It's somebody else's. But if the trust says Jeff Wick's the trustee and Jeff Wick's the beneficiary and it's irrevocable, a court's not gonna respect that anyway. So um, to, to really kind of make the assets remote from creditors, you literally have to give up sort of dominion and control over those assets. And it turns out when people feel, realize that, they're like, oh, no, I don't want to give away my money. I might need it someday. So it turns out that a trust is not really, except in maybe some very arcane circumstances that I'd have to think hard about or that I don't generally deal with. Trust is not really a good substitute for, it's not an asset protection mechanism. Thank you, Jeff, appreciate that. Um, we had another question come in from Robert. He says, uh, my home is in a revocable trust and I also have a ladybird deed and a will. Is my home protected from a business liability issue? Thanks. Oh, well, just as I said, whatever's in a revocable trust is treated as yours individually. So if Robert were to get sued and a big judgment against him, um, 
Robert's home, if it's in his revocable trust, is just as available as it would be as if it were not in the trust. But there are <coughs> certain protections and I don't, I'm not gonna poke around to get those, those that list of property that someone cannot take from you. But I, I, if memory serves, some portion of the equity in your home may be protected from creditors. But then he mentioned Lady Bird Deed. Um, I do lots of those in the estate planning context, also known as an enhanced life estate deed. That also is a deed where the home is still, well, first of all, it's either in the trust or it's in a ladybird deed. It can't be in both. So first hypothetical, we'll assume it was in the trust. Alternatively, we'll instead assume that it's subject to a, a ladybird deed. And what that means is Robert still owns it. And therefore it's just as available to his creditors as if it weren't in a ladybird deed. But what the heck is a ladybird deed? It's very simple at core. It's a great deed because when you die, if your home, well, let's say first you're you're not married, just to simplify things, and your home is titled in your name alone. When you die, your home becomes a part of your probate estate and has to be probated. Well, the ladybird deed avoids that. The ladybird deed essentially is where you name typically your children as the automatic owners upon your death, call it beneficiaries. It's a deed where you can designate beneficiaries on your death, but at the same time, you're reserving all rights of ownership including the right to change your mind about those beneficiaries, including the right to sell the property and keep the proceeds and say, kids, too bad, I changed my mind. But those are that, that's available to the ex same extent as a home would be if it weren't in a labor deed. Anything else? We are at 11.50 and is our official end time noon? Yes. And okay. Simeon, it looked like you were trying to speak, but we're muted. Oh, sorry, you're right. I fell for it. Um, so Robert, did that answer your question? Do you have any other follow-up questions to that? No, thank you. That did answer the question. <clears throat> great, great. So yeah. as Jeff mentioned, um, we do have about nine, 10 more minutes before we have to wrap up. Uh, are there any other Question, general questions for Jeff at this point. Yeah, Dan. Um, I know that this might not be your like main area of expertise, but you did mention, Jeff, that you uh, do a lot of real estate. So we don't own the space that we're in. I mentioned, I touched on this earlier. Uh, Landlord is going to be selling it. Um, we're probably going to try to get him to put us onto like a 10 year lease to protect ourselves before the sale. Um, let's say that we didn't do that. And he's, he's, he's been really shady about like, the whole thing and is he might sell it without informing us um is there any implicit corporate real estate law like we've been renting the space for close to 10 years uh it's transitioned now from like future fields llc to future field studios llc but implicitly it's like the same people renting it um are we protected in any way at all or is it purely a handshake deal because of it we're in the corporate realm and not in the uh, or the commercial realm and not in the rents like the personal realm. Um, Got obviously, it. I know it's not like the best way to no, be it. doing business, but it's worked so far. Yeah, quite. Cool. So, got it. Is that the question? Yeah. Right. First, do you have a written lease? No, 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 we don't because he he gave us a lease a few months ago. It was just not worth signing. It was very bad, so we need to hire a lawyer to to develop a lease for him to sign. Um, so there is no lease currently, okay. and there never well, has been one. Pro, um, yeah. So that's pro. It, it's always a good idea to have a written lease. Obviously, only if what's contained in that lease is agreeable to you. <laughs> yeah. If not, then you right. Then you're just sort of maintaining some verbal status quo, which in the commercial context, as you point out, there, there really are not the same protections as there are in a residential lease. So, because the law does presume that everybody operating in the commercial context are sophisticated and they don't need most protections that consumers need. Just as you, yeah. 
So yeah. it would be best if you and the landlord had a written lease, obviously a nice long term with rates that you can agree upon, but who knows if that's gonna happen. But let's say you did have a written lease. Your next step though, is to ensure, and the lease will typically, it should say that you have the right to do this, to record what's called a notice of lease in the land records in the city or town in which, uh, in which your property sits. Because uh, when property changes hands, if there's not a notice of lease recorded in the land records, then you have much weaker rights than a new buyer can, uh, if I don't think, in, uh, maybe, I'd have to research this, but a notice of lease basically locks you in. But of course you can't do a notice of lease unless you have an actual lease. And presumably unless the actual lease gives you authority to record a notice of lease in the land records. But if you have all that stuff, then the new buyer is on a sort of what we call record notice, is on notice of the existence of your lease. And in most circumstances, other than bankruptcy, where all bets are off, bankruptcy of any party, sort of all bets become off and the whole overlay of federal bankruptcy law. But in the absence of like bankruptcy, that landlord uh, generally would have to, would, would have to respect um, the terms of your lease as evidenced by the notice notice of lease. And there's a statute, I think it's Title 27, uh, VSA 341 maybe, where it says what has to go into a notice of lease or what should go into one. But again, you can't do a notice of lease if you don't even have a lease. You have a verbal, I guess, lease, but... Um, uh, I mean, we have like some emails with him that could probably uh, like, but I, I just, we, like, as soon as we looked into it, we did ask him for a lease. It just really, it was insane what he provided to us. It, right. it was just like not a lease. All right. Well, it was just, it was no better than the emails, really. Okay. Well, that's unfortunate, but um, yeah. Well, maybe when the new buyer buys, there'll be a buyer that presents a nice, clear lease to you that you'll like. Who knows? But the new yeah, buyer, we might. just want to we want to lock in the rates that we have. So you answered my question, which is that we need to get him to sign this lease, which I think he's going to do. Um, and then make sure that that lease allows for us to submit a notice of the lease and then submit that so that the city is aware of it, which will protect us when the new person buys it. We want to get locked into as low of a rent rate as possible because we're paying very little right now. So that makes sense. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Thanks for the question, Dan. Any, anyone else have a question? Something that they want to follow up on or something that hasn't been addressed? I would like to ask a question. <clears throat> sure, Robert. Um, rather than try to put it in the chat box. Uh, Jeff, you, you talked a little while ago about um, owners' investment and, and properly putting it into the checking account, et cetera. <laughs> Uh, I didn't follow that format exactly. I kind of shot from the hip. About a year ago, I started a consulting business and I paid out of my personal pocket and, and checkbook, et cetera, all the upstart costs, um, which were several thousand. And as I began uh, having income from the business, I reimbursed myself. Yeah. Is that a problem down the road for any reason? Well, I mean... I wouldn't lose too much sleep over it if I were you because you can't change the past. Right. Um, but, you know, strictly speaking, you know, the better approach or the best approach is to, is to basically fund all your startup costs from you to the LLC's checking account and then writing the checks right. out of the LLC's account. That's the purest approach. Right. But, I mean... There's nothing you can do about that now, and so right. I've got this. I've got excellent documentation on everything I spent, receipts, uh, logs, etc. I yeah. I reimbursed myself to the penny and made note of what it was. Yeah, yeah. Um, okay. I never actually made thousands of dollars investment in in cash or check to the bank account and then paid from there. I kind of did it in reverse, not knowing. Yeah. Um, is there any sense of me making a a, a a one dollar or a thousand dollar deposit in there as an investment to show goodwill or does that even matter at this point i don't know if it matters at this point but the idea that what matters at this point is going forward anytime you need to advance money to the business 
um, make a deposit from your personal account into your business account and then write those checks from the business account. In other words, just going forward, do it the pure way. Okay. And that's okay. the best you can do. Right. And, okay. and you know, whatever your business is, you don't have to tell me what it is, but just make sure you've got good liability insurance because yes, that's I do. ultimately what you want to, you know, many times it's the, the insurance settlement and they don't get to, you know, all the way to piercing your assets because they're satisfied the the claimant is satisfied with the insurance settlement perhaps yes i do have liability and the most i could uh, uh um take out on errors and omission from this company was fifty thousand. i oh. would have taken more but i have a million a million dollar liability and fifty thousand errors and omission as insurance okay. policy. i don't know yeah so you can only do what you can do and Got a good insurance agent, uh, just yes. say, hey, do you think this is enough? Yep. Jeff, uh, Jeff, oh, sorry, Robert, I didn't mean to cut you off. No, thank you very much. I appreciate it. Jeff, just a quick follow-up to that. Uh, if, if somebody is going to reimburse themselves for money that they invested oh. on the opposite end, how would they write that check back to themselves, claim it? Would it be considered taxable like income at that point? Oh, oh, oh. Um, I think I know what you're asking with one minute left. Um, maybe I'll restate the question. Maybe it's different. You said reimburse. But the other question I didn't answer is, how the heck do you get money out of this business in a way that's not going to jeopardize this respecting of the corporate entity? Well, let's say you're, you're doing everything right. You, you funded the business through your, uh, you made a deposit from your personal checking account to your business checking account. Then you, you get some revenue. That all goes into your business checking account. You pay some expenses. That all comes out of your business checking account. But then your, your business checking account balance, because you're doing well, keeps getting bigger and bigger. You're like, how the heck do I get money out of there? That's my money. I want it. You just write a check to yourself. And in the memo line, you put distribution, because that's how you get money out of an LLC as the owner. It's a distribution to its owner. It's an owner distribution. And that's not taxable. In fact, I'm going to recommend that each of you go see a tax accountant to figure out the taxability of your particular entity. But what you take out of a business is not your taxable income. Your taxable income when you're the owner of an LLC, let's say a single member LLC, is really a single member LLC is disregarded. The existence of it is disregarded by the IRS for tax purposes. They consider it to be a sole proprietorship for tax purposes. So what you do is you file a Schedule C, your account. Use an accountant. That's rule number one to make sure it gets done right. But it's the uh, all of the gross revenue minus the expenses of the business you have to declare on your Schedule C to your individual 1040. And whatever the sort of tax <laughs> profit is, is what your taxes are. It actually could be very different from the amount of checks you write to yourself from the business as a distribution, as you can imagine, because you might you might have to keep a bunch of money in the business and only take out a little, but you might still be taxed on a lot more because what you kept in the business still could be considered as taxable income to you, even though you didn't take it out. So anyway, that's all. Go see an accountant. That's just the best way to handle it. Lawyer for legal things, accountant for accounting things, insurance agent for insurance things, payroll company if you have employees. Great. Thank you, Jeff. Really appreciate it. It's 1201. I just want to respect everybody's time and um, think about wrapping up. Again, Jeff, thank you so much for taking what I know is very valuable time to share your wisdom and your expertise with us and um, appreciate that it will have a second life as, as a recording, which I know is going to help help future folks. So thank you very, very much. Wonderful. Thank on, on the Thank you. On the, on the topic of insurance, we are uh, we are planning to have um, a class coming up on, on insurance, I believe. Um, I'm not quite sure what the date is. If Rachel knows, perhaps she can mention that. Um, but mm -hmm. Just to jump in, it's not confirmed yet, but it will be the last two weeks of June. So keep an eye out on your emails. Um, you should all be receiving uh, emails from us at this point. Great. Thank you. <clears throat> also, um, uh, you can find past presentations on our cvoeo.org website. Just click on learn and find micro business and you will see, uh, find your way to our previously recorded uh, classes where this one will uh, eventually live, uh, as well as um, 
uh, links to other um, webinars to sign up for. So uh, Rachel, do you wanna go ahead and, and post um, the follow-up info? That'd be great. We'll um, I'm going to send it to everyone um, after this. I don't have my whole sheet lined no up this time, but thank you all for attending today. Yes. And uh, we will certainly be sharing contact information after this session. Yes, thank you everyone. Really appreciate you coming out. Yeah. Thank you, Jeff. Thank you. And I just want to say, I hope, I wish everybody uh, success in their endeavors. Thank, Thank you, you very much for your time. Thank you. Yeah, sure. Enjoy.